We'll call the Agriculture, Rural Development and Housing Policy Committee to order. Uh, we have had a majority of members check in. Uh, there's activities going on with the uh, uh, MinSQ system, and so I know they'll be filing in here as time goes on. Uh, we have a variety of updates uh, today uh, for the committee, and our first one is going to be the Department of Agriculture update on Palmer Amaranth. Uh, we have Denise Thede and uh, Tony Cordelet here, and they, uh, you may come to the testifiers table, and, uh, and please uh, proceed uh, whenever uh, you're ready to go. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Anthony Cordelet. I'm the supervisor of the Noxious Weed and Industrial Hemp Program at the department. And what we wanted to do today was give you a little update on uh, Palmer Amaranth, give you a, a quick summary of where we've been since 2016, and, um, and then entertain any of your questions. Um, so hopefully most of you are familiar with Palmer Amaranth. It's certainly one of the most significant um, weed issues to affect modern conventional agriculture in probably the last 30 or 40 years. Um, it's been spreading out of the southwestern U.S. for, um, you know, probably 50 years now, and it's, it has found its way into Minnesota. Um, I'll show you a map here of kind of the progression we've had over the last couple years. Um, you can see in 2016, we had two counties that, comprom or that was a total of uh, 33 sites where uh, Palmer was found. These were all through CRP. Um, uh, plantings, and uh, Lyon and Yellow Medicine County were the first ones to get impacted. Um, the next year, we ended up adding two more counties, um, and uh, also CRP, and it came through contaminated seed. And, um, and then in this year, we had our first two occurrences in uh, row crops, which is really what has concerned us the most, even though we've had it in CRP, um, for the past couple years, it's really the row crop system where Palmer's going to thrive and, and cause major problems to both corn and soybeans if it's allowed um, to, to get out of control. Um, I've also, hopefully there's a larger map of the one for 2018 that's the current status. You'll see there's some yellow counties on there. Those are locations that I want to point out. Um, where we've had uh, either instances where we've tested seed and it came back positive for Palmer amaranth in that seed and it was put out into the field and planted, um, but we haven't found Palmer amaranth in any of those counties. Um, and so we will continue to be monitoring those through, um, through our eradication program. So basically our uh, Department of Agriculture response um, has, has been uh, uh, quite productive in the last couple of years. We added Palmer Amaranth to our noxious weed list in 2014 as a response to Palmer Amaranth coming into Iowa. We knew at that point it was only a matter of time. Um, before it found its way up to Minnesota. The reason that's significant is um, we can add things fairly quickly now uh, through revisions to the weed law in 2009. And as many of you know, if something's not listed or regulated, it takes a lot of time to get folks behind it to do anything, whereas we were able to hit the ground in 2016 within 24 hours of getting that first report of Palmer Amaranth and to begin um, assessing the situation. So a big part of our response has also been partnering with the University of Minnesota Extension. Our colleagues over there like uh, Dean Durgan and, and Jeff Gonzalez. Um, and it's been a lot of scouting, um, scouting fields close to where we've, where we've confirmed it. Obviously doing site confirmations, that requires us to work a lot with the landowners. We've been trying to protect the landowners as much as we can in this. These are farmers. They didn't cause this problem, um, and they didn't intentionally want this. One of the things that's very common in, um, in rural parts of, of Minnesota is if you're the one with the bad plant, everybody points their fingers at you. And we've tried to be very, very careful about that, making sure that the farmer themselves are protected. That ensures trust that they will report to us. Um, and so site confirmation, I, I, I add that to let you know that we also put a caveat on data protection. 
Each one of our sites where we find Palmer, we establish a management plan and we work directly with the farmer on that. So they are also involved and, and I think they're comfortable being involved in the process. Um, a big part of this process has been educating all the stakeholders, whether it's you know the, the egg commodity groups, um, farmers themselves, crop consultants, um, any industry reps uh, that are out there and letting them know what this issue is and, and what is actually happening with it. Um, we're working regionally. We just had a big Palmer Summit at the University of Minnesota. It was a combination between us and um, uh, University Extension. We brought in all of our neighboring states. So we had folks from Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, North Dakota and South Dakota talking about Palmer. And by the way, Palmer is now in all of those states. North Dakota just found their first finds this year. That's gonna be really important if we're gonna solve this problem. I know that we tend to think within our geographic boundaries, but weeds don't, and nor does agriculture. And then the last thing we're really trying to promote um, uh, a lot of research specifically around um, genetic testing, and Denise will talk more about a seed test that we develop, but we're also hoping to find um, a researcher who can help us develop a field kit for identifying Palmer amaranth when it's small. It's very hard to tell Palmer from any of the other common pigweeds in Minnesota when they're seedlings, and that's when farmers need to be um, knowing when Palmer's out there so that they can manage appropriately. This slide's a little busy, but what I wanted to show you is since 2016, we've had a total of 18 landowners impacted with Palmer. Um, about 42 of these plantings have, have been CRP, um, and then the two soybean fields we found this year. I wanna put this into perspective. Most of the counties you see on those maps are highlighted by color, and so the problem looks uh, you know, really bad if you think, well, that whole county's infested. But to give you an example, in Redwood County, we found four plants, and we were able to eradicate those. In Jackson, it was one single female plant. And so, um, Although Palmer is making its way around Minnesota, it's at very low densities. That's good and bad. Um, that means that we got a better chance to control it. also means it's harder to find. <coughs> the good news in our efforts since 2016, just focusing on the CRP plantings through all of the management that we've done, we've found no Palmer reproducing um, uh, at this time. So last, last year was our first year we found no Palmer on any of those sites. Part of that's through our efforts. The other part on CRP is that a lot of the native grass reestablishment and the Forbes are coming in and they outcompete the Palmer, which is good. Um, so let's keep our fingers crossed with that. One thing we have had happen is we've, we've just, this fall, uh, late winter after harvest, we got a couple reports, three in fact. Um, luckily those farmers knew enough to keep vegetation material so that we could genetically test it and it turned out two of the three were not Palmer. The third one we couldn't get to before it was destroyed. What's technically happening is farmers get so busy during the harvest and that's when Palmer's the most noticeable that they just don't have time to stop and say, you know, I'm gonna bog down what I'm doing to call the MDA and wait for their response. Not that our response isn't quick, but I understand where they're coming from. So they've been reporting late. We're trying to get the word out them to hopefully um, increase that. The, the six Ziploc baggies there show you from 2017 on three of the 33 sites from 2016 that we were monitoring, all of the Palmer we found in the state fit into those six bags and we destroyed it. So our management is working. And I also, we need to give a lot of kudos to the farmers out there because they're the ones that are really on the front line helping us. Um, there's only a couple staff at the MDA working on this full time. So without the farmer's involvement, um, we wouldn't be having this success. Finally, I just wanna quickly show you, these are some maps of uh, the last uh, couple years with soybean fields. This is part of our cooperative agriculture pest survey that we do um, for all kinds of pests and diseases. They've added Palmer to that, and they're randomly going out and visiting um, uh, egg fields throughout the state. It depends on the year and how much money we have devoted to it, what we can cover. That includes soybeans, which is pictured here, and then this last year in 2018, we were able to visit farm fields. And the good news is we haven't found any Palmer in any of those random surveys. So. If Palmer is in places we don't know, um, it's at very low levels, and that's really what, what this type of data is telling us. 
Um, so with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Denise, and then when she's completed, we can answer any oh, questions. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna focus on how is Palmer getting into the state and specifically focusing on the seed supply. So, uh, you know, as you know, all seed that's sold in the state needs to be labeled. And I'm showing you an example of a, a CRP label. These native mixtures are quite complex and they often contain many different species. In order to correctly label a mix like this, all of these different seed lots would have been tested, uh, both for their physical purity, noxious weed seeds, and germination characteristics before they were mixed into this mixture, blended into the mixture. And so this testing and this, this fundamental way that seed has been labeled for a long time has provided a framework for us to really um, build, uh, build a new solution in terms of keeping Palmer amaranth out of the state. So the noxious weed seed test allows labelers to indicate noxious weeds, in this case, none found. Um, and what, what was needed to be done was that we needed to have a way to detect Palmer amaranth um, in that noxious weed seed exam. And so Minnesota did a smart thing and that is that they worked on a new method for detecting Palmer um, that allowed seed companies and labelers to be able to identify Palmer in seed. Um, subsequently, you know, Iowa, Wisconsin, and now North Dakota have all added uh, Palmer to their prohibited weed seed lists. And this technology is gonna help them also be successful. So I'm gonna talk about, about what we did um, so typically, a noxious weed seed exam is a visual inspection of 25,000 seeds, and you can see how complicated it is. A seed analyst really needs to be able to recognize all the individual species in a mix. Um, and the problem with all of the pigweeds is that visually you can't differentiate between a red root pigweed or a spiny amaranth and palmer amaranth. And so <clears throat> the seed testing community needed a solution to really pick out Palmer amaranth. So <clears throat> Minnesota supported the validation first of a sequencing method, and that was the first method that was deployed in commercial labs. Uh, there were three labs participating, um, and <clears throat> initially the testing was quite expensive and so seed companies were adopting it but frustrated by the expense. Since that time, the University of Illinois has published some uh, PCR methods that have, are simpler and lower cost and these methods now are being adopted by companies labeling seed for sale in Minnesota. One of the challenges that we face in Minnesota is that there are testing labs across the country that test seed for labeling purposes. Not all testing labs are familiar with our requirements for genetic testing in Minnesota. And so one of the things that we've done is we have updated the all states noxious weed seed list, which is maintained by the USDA and to indicate that in Minnesota, we do require genetic testing. So if we are going to go in and audit a seed company's records, and there was amaranth in a specific seed lot, we would expect to see genetic testing results for that seed. This is a really important tool that needs to be employed to make sure that seed companies don't sell contaminated seed in the state. So the regulatory program here in Minnesota is a program that is intended to ensure compliance with both the Federal Seed Act and the Minnesota Seed Law. We routinely sample about 1,600 samples of seed for sale across the state. Generally, we're sampling between January and June, the primary seed selling season. And you can see on this map the distribution of where we've collected samples in the previous year. We've got excellent compliance with the requirements of the seed law, so we see a very low violation rate. And one of the things that we wanted to do 
was to focus on native seeds since CRP plantings were the main um, pathway into Minnesota. We wanted to have a little bit more surveillance on native seed that was being sold and planted in Minnesota. So in 2017 and 2018, we increased our number of native seed samples up into the 80 to 140 range. In 2017, we did not detect any, any seed lots with Palmer amaranth as a contaminant in the random sampling that we did. But in 2018, we did identify three seed lots that were contaminated. So this is an important mechanism to assess how seed companies are doing in terms of compliance with the seed law. And obviously enforcement is an important mechanism to make sure that they uh, do their due diligence in labeling and selling seed in Minnesota. So I wanted to follow up. Tony presented where you know uh, these introductions and, uh, and their occurrence in Minnesota. And I just wanted to give a brief overview on the current status of the enforcement. So in 2016, in Lyon and Yellow Medicine counties, we were able to confirm the presence of Palmer in the seed mix that was planted on those 33 locations. However, the labeler did not have the records that were required by law, by the Minnesota seed law. So we weren't able to track back and find the actual source of the contaminant. Um, that labeler was assessed a penalty of $4,000 and we settled with a $2,000 penalty and a compliance agreement for their um, performance going forward. In 2017, um, in Todd and Douglas County, we were able to confiscate 10 different seed sources from the landowner whose property had been planted in CRP. And we were able to identify a grass mix that was contaminated with Palmer. Um, similar to the previous year, the labeler was not able to provide the records. The seed was, in fact, not even labeled. Um, so um, we are currently... Um, still trying to secure a settlement offer from that labeler, um, but a, we, ha we assessed a penalty of $15,000 with a settlement offer of 10,000, and that is still pending. If we don't get a settlement offer, we will be proceeding to court with that case. Uh, in 2018, in our routine random sampling, we discovered a contaminated seed source uh, that was planted on 1,400 acres in Pennington, Marshall, Red Lake, and Roseau counties. And um, we, were, we ordered the labeler to provide records to us for that seed lot. Similar to previous cases, um, the, the records, the, well, the seed labeler appealed the order to provide records. So this case is currently in the Attorney General's office. Um, where we're trying to negotiate a settlement. Uh, the initial penalty was 18000 with an offer to settle for $10,000. So finally, uh, in late 2018, the finding in Redwood County in a field crop, we were able to track back the source of that seed. We, we have a pretty, it's a pretty good hypothesis Manure was spread on those fields from local feedlots. We went to those feedlots and sampled sunflower hulls that were being fed in those feedlots, and we were able to detect Palmer amaranth in those sunflower hulls. So the screenings from seed and grain cleaning may also be an important new pathway into Minnesota with the potential to be moving um, through the feed supply. And that's something that uh, we're gonna be looking at much more closely um, at, based on our authority with the Minnesota Screenings Act. So that's our summary of Palmer.
Very good. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you so much. Um, just a couple of questions I have. Uh, first, as relating to finding it in the right of way, has the department been sharing information like with uh, count, the county association and MnDOT as to this issue and what they should be looking out for? Yes, Chair Weber and members, uh, yes, we have. And in, in one of the first things that we do in a county where it does get an infestation occurs is work with the county egg inspector which is sort of coordinating all the township and city work from okay. there and also working with MnDOT. Um, we have worked with MnDOT too to provide them sort of a radius, not the exact location, but a, a kind of radius around the areas that would impact their state highway system so that they can monitor those areas too. Okay. And then, and then one other question, um, as it relates to industrial hemp, um, that being a more herbaceous type plant and that if, is that going to be a harder crop within which to find the, the amaranth growth uh, in, as we go ahead? Yes, Chair, member, or Chair Weber and members, um, I don't think, uh, so hemp probably won't, um, or, or the way grain hemp is grown at least on large fields, uh, Palmer probably won't be able to compete as well. I, I can't say that for sure because hemp is just starting to grow. Right. Um, it certainly could be an issue, um, but I would think it would be more in washout areas and things like that in the fields. Okay. But hemp is traditionally drilled fairly close together. But it's kind of, it is also, your, you make a good point, it's, it's, the farmers are trying to find their way with it, so if they use wider row spacings, it could potentially be an okay. issue. Okay. Thank you. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, Senator Lang is distracting me. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's the uh, question. I'm uh, uh, still kind of new and learning a lot about this, and what I want to understand is um, the, approaching it through the seeds is clearly makes sense to me. Do we do anything with herbicides to try to eradicate it? Is it resistant? Does that play a role in any of this? Or what other, like I'm assuming that there's multifaceted approaches that, and if you covered that already, I apologize if you're repeating yourself, but could you just maybe give me a quick thousand foot view of that? Well, one of the things about Palmer amaranth that makes it such an aggressive weed is that it has evolved multiple modes of herbicide resistance, and that's why it's so challenging to control. The plants that we found in Redwood County were glyphosate tolerant. Um, and every time we test um, a plant in a county, we're not only testing to make sure it's Palmer, but we're testing to determine whether it's resistant to specific herbicides. So that's something that, that we're gonna be tracking. There are herbicides though that you can use to control it, and the U of M Extension folks have done some good work. <clears throat> To, to help us identify those herbicides, milestone, and there's a second one, um, Tony. Yeah, and those are for non-crop areas, but right. you're seeing a lot more, think products like dicamba and those uh, modes of action being used again for Palmer, although it's able to adapt um, and adapt resistance to those also. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, so the best mode is clearly to try to eradicate the seeds from coming in as we put that stuff down. And then uh, you said that, and, and I'm not sure I understand that you said that it was a herbicide for non-crop areas. Is that what your food crops? Is that what you said? Is that because it's more toxic or something? Or, Mr. Chair, uh, it, Senator, um, the reason I bring that up, she mentioned a couple products that mm -hmm. we've used in CRP, which are non-crop areas, but farmers more to I think where your question is where herbicide resistance mm -hmm. would come into play mm -hmm. more. Um, they're going to be using products labeled for egg lands, so that, that, that's what I was referring to. Um, oh, got the, it. the other thing I would add is, I, we don't have pictures of it here today, but Jeff Gonzalez at the U has some great pictures of the problem with Palmer is it's such a fast grower that if you miss a window of opportunity to spray it, which could be two days, and there's pictures of this from Illinois fields where Palmer will just take over. The spray won't do anything, you know, literally 48 hours later compared to what it would do when you hit it at the right time. And the thing that farmers are challenged with is trying to identify it as being Palmer at that stage versus is it water hemp or some other pigweed. Right. One last question. So when, when we're trying to avoid that, um, and I, I'm sympathetic, I, mean, I don't know the science, but I, I get what you're saying. It sounds like it'd be frustrating, especially if the window is so narrow and we're trying to 
I was looking at the part of your presentation of just identifying seeds that are different. It looks like it was difficult. Um, <clears throat> do we have folks that right now are, are currently spraying for that in like large quantities or is it usually just isolated where they think it might be occurring? Like, and I'm not sure, and this could be a very clearly non-farm question because someone who didn't grow up on one, do you spray the herbicide over the whole field hoping to catch it wherever it is or do you know where it's at and then you try to just catch it in that populated area? How does that work? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Isaacson, um, you're exactly right when you say it is spread broadcast. It's okay. usually, there's farmers that are using a pre-application, which has residual, as well as a post-application. Got it. So to your point, we could actually have more Palmer showing up in the state that we know about, but it's not resistant, and those farmers' herbicide practices are controlling it. Um, so it's really only the either herbicide resistant varieties that we're going to really see become problematic or it's going to be the ones that are in non-crop land. Promise it's the last one now. Thank you. And so is that part of the normal um, cocktail we're using to treat when we look at fields when we're spraying herbicides? Is that kind of part and parcel with what's standard or is that just be recently we're doing that? Is that the same thing or how does, I mean, when a farmer gets a lot, plot of land, right, and they've got to make sure there's not weeds, is there just a normal cocktail we put out there and this would be included in that or? Mr. Chair, Senator okay. Isaacson, yes, for the most part, common water hemp is very widespread throughout the state and it's right, closely related to Palmer. So a lot of the same modes of action are being used for both. And they've been using, farmers have been using those cocktails, as you call them, for probably close to 15, 20 years now just for water hemp. So. One other question, Mr. Cordelet. As it relates, you mentioned uh, the dicamba uh, uh, weed control. Uh, in light of the, of the rules that surround that now, if someone were to fall outside of the uh, time frame, uh, did notice it, uh, would, is there a provision for them to be uh, given permission to use that if, if they have a product that is successful and qualifies under the dicamba? It's Chair Weber and members. Um, I think because of the time frame for, that currently exists, and I'm not an expert on that for dicamba itself, I don't think you'd be spraying um, past that okay. very far for efficacy on Palmer, okay. um, if that makes sense. Okay. By, that, by the time I think they give you for the final date, um, that might be too late for Palmer, in, unless it was a replanted field. And I don't know of any exception given for that, so that might be something we have to look at down the road if Palmer becomes more frequent okay. in egg fields. Very good, thank you. Any other questions, committee members? Senator Johnson. Oh, Senator, Senator Lang. Oh, you're pointing to him. Excuse me. That's twice he skipped me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, this is probably for Mr. Corlett. Uh, uh, you, you know, as we sit here, we, you know from the get-go that we've been paying attention to the Palmer Amaranth problem, and we've talked about it a lot in this committee over the last few years. And, you know, the, the second slide in your presentation here, you're going from uh, two counties to four counties to six counties. And I know you mentioned that there was only four plants in one of the location, but I guess my first question is, is that consistent throughout those counties throughout the states? Is that a consistent number? Are they all very small numbers, very, I don't know, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, uh, it's a great question. The CRP fields uh, had much more Palmer in them um, just because they were planted, uh, drilled in that way. So you're talking about we had some that might be averaging um, everything from a plant, an acre on a 40 acre field, so that's 40 plants, uh, up to, you know, six or seven plants per acre, um, which is a lot when you consider a plant that can produce anywhere from 250,000 to a million seeds per plant. Um, the, the row crop fields were very small, um, and that's really, again, where our concern is. Not that we're not concerned about CRP, but our focus there was to keep it from spreading into the surrounding row crop fields. Um, but right now the row crops are so far that we've seen are very low even in North Dakota. Um, the reports there are a few plants here and there. Um, but that can change very quickly. And if I showed you a similar map in Iowa, you went from 2015 with five counties to by this year it's over 50, I think, and the Iowa-Minnesota border has plenty of counties with Palmer in it, and they don't have a program like we do. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. Do you think that, a, a, couple, well, a couple questions with that, do you think that's just because of the increased uh, 
looking for it? Is the increased awareness of it? And is it, do you believe that those, well, the, the row crop fields when you have six or seven per acre, uh, the, whatever you did to eradicate it, do you feel that that was effective? Chair Weber, Senator Lang, the, the interesting thing about that is all of the reports of Palmer have come from farmers and the farmers in both row crop examples actually rogue their fields. It's not as common as it used to be. Um, and so to your point, um, our fear is there could be uh, increased vigilance by certain farmers and so we're seeing it in the row crops. Is there more out there that we don't know about? That's kind of our fear. And that's why I showed those maps of why I think those random surveys that our um, CAPS program are doing in soybean and corn fields are important. Yeah. No, that was my, actually my next question, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Rob, you're welcome. Uh, no, I just was looking at the map here and, and got a little concerned when I walked in. I walked in late and I apologize for that, but it looks like uh, two-thirds of my district <laughs> became, uh, you know, a little suspect to this here in 2018. Could you elaborate a little bit on, uh, have you pinpointed where that seed came from uh, and been able to do that? Or is there a connection between those four counties uh, where that was found? That would be the four counties in northwestern Minnesota. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it, this is an active investigation, um, and so I can't give a lot of details. You know, it's, it's still an open case. Uh, the seed was sold in one of those counties to CRP um, landowners in all four counties. It was all planted in 2017. We discovered remnants of that seed in 2018, and um, now we're in the process of, um, well, we haven't gotten the records for that seed, that seed mixture, so we can't track where else it might have been sold in Minnesota. Okay. Um, but <clears throat> we Ms. did not find it in the field. So it was in the seed, but it never germinated and developed. Sure. So that was a single point or a single source where that mm -hmm. came from. Okay. And then one, one final question then. Does 30 <laughs> below zero, does that help kill any of this? Because maybe we don't have to worry about this problem anymore. Well, <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Johnson, that's a great question. And in fact, um, we do, there is a theory um, from our Iowa partners in Wisconsin that um, although we know Palmer can establish here and it can reproduce and grow, will it do the same thing it did in Arkansas, Missouri, um, and, and uh, the states in the, in the southeast? Um, I don't really have an opinion on that yet, but it does relate to your question about cold tolerance of the seed and how cold hardy it is. I do think there's something going on where we're seeing a slower rate of spread than what we would have seen if we were in, let's say, Missouri or southern Iowa. So. Anyone else? If not, thank you for the presentation. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, future information. Next, uh, we have uh, um, Angie Amborn uh, with the MDA, and this is going to be an update on the emerald ash borer, and she might have better results concerning the cold weather for us. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. Ah, that was a great segue. Thank you. <laughs> so today is not a good day to be an emerald ash borer. <laughs> All right, so well, let's start back here so you can see um, what an emerald ash borer is. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with emerald ash borer, um, but I'll just give you a quick brief, um, you know, 1,000 foot view of it. Um, emerald ash borer is a wood boring beetle that attacks all species of ash, uh, true ash. Um, it's from China, and it was first found in Minnesota in 2009. Since um, it was found in the U.S., emerald ash borer has killed millions of ash trees, um, and it's probably on target if you talk to a lot of researchers to functionally remove ash from um, from the system, and as we know it, um, ash provides a lot of ecological and economic benefits. And just in perspective, um, Minnesota alone has close to a billion ash trees. So you can see that um, that's a large part of our natural resources. Excuse me, uh, Senator Hur. Yeah, uh, sorry, yes. I, I 
Did, did you say feng shui? Huh? Remote? Did you say no, feng shui? No, functionally. Oh, okay. All right. Just thought I'd check on that. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Now I'm, now I'm messed Please up. Please proceed. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, yes. this, is, this is a map for those of you that aren't familiar with where Emerald Ashbor is um, in, the, in the country. It's pretty much spread through the eastern half of um, part of the United States. Um, and then it's slowly making its way westward. One of the reasons I like this map is because, as you can see on that western edge there, you can see how it's just you know, slowly moving its way west into Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota. Um, and so those, it's, it, it is moving, um, and one of the primary ways that it moves is through, um, through human-mediated movement and traditionally through firewood. It does spread on its, on its own a little ways every year, but the primary movement of spread is through humans. Um, and so that, that's the country. In the state itself, right now, EAB has been documented in 17 of our 87 counties, um, and we've also found it in 68 of our 853 cities. The most recent find was in Wright County, and that was in um, September, and so um, that county has um, since been quarantined. So you can see up there, um, this is our online map, just for those of you that are not familiar with it. Um, the red lines on this map show you where the EAB quarantine currently is. And then the green area is an area that we um, have started for the general public and for city um, and other people that manage EAB so that they can know where the generally infested area is. And so this map um, gets updated as new finds of EAB are input inputted into the system. Um, and it, a buffer is built around that. And so the, the, we know um, that if a tree is reported in this area, it's a good chance it has emerald ash borer because that area is generally infested. Um, so the two main programs that we have um, with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture in how we work specifically with emerald ash borer is we do biological control, and then we also work with outreach to cities. So we'll start with biological control. So biological control of emerald ash borer was initiated in 2010. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with that program, we release tiny little stingless wasps um, out into areas where emerald ash borer is present. Um, and those are supplied by the USDA. Um, there's a rearing facility in Brighton, Michigan. And so we go out to a site, we assess where emerald ash borer is, and then we get those parasitoids and we go out into um, the woods and we actually release them. And so sometimes they come live in cups and we just dump them right on the trees. And sometimes there are these little things called obinators and they're little, <laughs> they're little, plastic, little plastic pill bottles that have eggs that, are, um, that have EAB in them and we just tie them to trees and then the parasitoids come out. Um, so right now, um, we're releasing in many sites. You can see on that map up there, those are all sites where we're currently releasing EAB uh, parasitoids. And right now, we have, we're working on, we've gone through three phases of this project, and those have all been funded by the Environment and uh, Natural Resources Trust Fund. And we're in phase three. And what we're doing now, um, besides releasing, is we're trying to assess if those releases are actually you know, doing anything. And one of the ways that we do that is to see if those parasitoids are actually establishing in an area. And how we do that is we do intensive sampling. So we go out and we take branch samples and we peel back um, the bark looking for, you can see up there in that, um, in, uh, you can probably see it on here, there's a little, where it looks all wormy there, so that's where an EAB larvae was, and all those little things that look like little grains of rice are actually um, the parasitoids, so they infest the EAB larvae, and they develop inside there, and then they kill the EAB, and so we go and we look for, specifically for that. The other thing that we do is we peel bark, and we go out and we peel bark samples off of trees, and then we sift them. And then, as Denise showed you, we were looking through those, all those tiny little seeds. We look through all these tiny little pieces of bark flex, and we look to find emerald ash borer eggs. And also on that screen, you can see there's an egg there that, with an EAB, um, or an EAB egg there, and inside of that egg is the parasitoid that is growing. So those are the um, two of the ways that we're assessing um, what's going on with the EAB parasitoids. So just to make sure I understand, so basically the wasp attacks the, the bug and then the, what it 
it's injects into the bug actually goes into the egg and that and to kill it in that manner is that it um, yes, Mr. Chair. So what happens is we have a couple different kinds of parasitoids. So we have one parasitoid that actually injects its eggs into the EAB larvae and actually eat, kind of develops inside the larvae and kind of eats its way out and the, the little parasitoids come out. And then there's also another one that it, it lays its eggs inside of emerald ash borer eggs. Okay. And so then they, they come out. So they're very tiny, like the size of the head of a pin. Um, and they're very good at finding EAB larvae and eggs. All right. So, oh, excuse oh, me, sorry. Senator Westrom. Mr. Yep. Mr. Chair, um, as I'm sitting here listening to this, uh, connect. Uh, you're, you've are you part of the LCCMR funding that we've yes uh, funded as well? So just connect those dots for us uh, here at the table. But just just as we realize how uh, interconnected some of our different commissions and funding sources are to help help with this. Right. So this yeah. EAB, Mr. Chair, this EAB. Um, Biological Control Project was funded by the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund through the LCCMR committee, and so we have been we have gone through three rounds of funding with them, and the, and that is how um, currently we're paying for this biological control program. Does that answer your question, Senator Westrom? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Isaacson. So once they take out the worm and the, what happens to them next? What are they doing? Are they just going on to be wasps or what? <laughs> I mean, I'm no. Again, that's a great I question. But I'm like, once you've killed the parasite, what then happens to whatever's left over that's still alive and that whatever killed it? Okay, so you mean when the parasitoids come out of the larvae? Okay, so then they're going to come out and they're going to seek out new, new larvae. So they're they're coming out. They're going to find new larvae and new eggs. So you know how just like how an insect reproduces, they're doing the same thing, but they're using emerald ash borer as their reproductive source. Senator, and then, so what I meant, what's the connection between that and wasps? Then I must have missed something. Or did you say it? There, so the wasp is actually the parasitoid. So it's a tiny little. That's actually what's doing the killing ah. of of the EAB. So the wasp lays its eggs inside the emerald ash borer. It's it's very alien like. Like yeah. yeah. Uh, Senator Her. Uh, along the same line as uh, Sir Isaacson, uh, is, is the wasp an invasive uh, species or native to our state, and uh, does it uh, have a you know future side effect? That's a great question, Mr. Yes, Chair. Please proceed. Um, so they, so now when these these wasps have gone through serious testing through um, at the the Brighton the USDA um, facility, and so they've done they've done a lot of host choice testing with these insects, and it, it went through years of testing before they were approved for release, and they have very very low rates of um, any attacking any other insects, and. There, there, I think there is one of them that will occasionally attack another bupressid, which is a, another related beetle in that same family as emerald ash borer. But there are, they're specific to the, that type of beetle, so they have no other, no other consequences. Senator Herr. Uh, following question, what will be more effective, like uh, using this walls or the, um, take, removing a tr um, emerald ash borer uh, infected trees? Also a great Zambor. question, Mr. Chair. Okay, so that's that's a great question. Um, that's kind of an apples and oranges question. Um, so biological control of emerald ash borer is one of the only things that we have in terms of management that can work on a landscape level. So we only use biological control in areas where it's wooded, in areas where there's a large amount of ash, and areas where tree removal and tree injection is not is not feasible. So in the, in this in the middle of a city in an urban area, you would definitely do a tree removal or in tree treatments of injections. But if you were in um, you know down in the southeastern part of the state in Winona along the river, that's where we employ emerald ash borer biological control. So it's really dependent on the type of you know habitat and environment that you're in. Senator Goggin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I live in Red Wing, and we just had the uh, emerald ash borer there last year. So, they're, are they are they doing this wasp treatment as well? Because I know they're they're not cutting trees down there; they're doing some kind of treatment of some kind. Ms. Amborn, Mr. Chair. Um, so, we are releasing in the Red Wing area. Yep. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Senator Isaacson. 
<clears throat> did I miss it? Did you, was the end of your last presentation explaining what the results of that were? I must have not caught that. So how, how, how effective, if you can sum that up real quick, was it? If I missed that already. Sandbar. Mr. Chair, so that is what the current part of this project is, right? So that's what the whole point of this in the last part is we're trying to assess um, the establishment of the parasitoids and how effective um, they are. And you know, quite frankly, that's a, that's a big task to do to assess what the, what the impact of these parasitoids are having on the emerald ash borer population. They have a little bit better data from, from Michigan where they've seen EAB come through, um, but we're kind of still on that front edge of that where you know, we're just getting these parasitoids established. So I think it's going to be a few years before we can really answer that question. Do we know if they work on uh, Asian carp or zebra mussels? No? <laughs> I'm curious. They would need some kind of like extra thing so they could get underwater. Gills would work too. Very good. Let's right. proceed. All right, so the other major project that we do um, is we assist communities um, with emerald ash borer. And one of the ways that we do this is we go out and we train community staff and industry professionals, and we spend a lot of time with um, public works, with um, city foresters. We spend a lot of time doing outreach to that group. Um, and one of the big things that have come out of all of this work that we've done has been we've developed these guidelines to slow the growth and spread of emerald ash borer. Um, and for those of you that haven't seen that document, it is on our website, and you can um, go and look at it. And we kind of lay out what a community should do from start to finish um, based on research that you know we've been a part of with the University of Minnesota, um, just our years of experience and what we have seen working with the cities and communities, um, what, what really works for them. Um, and in the process of that, we've held over 100 workshops, and we've trained um, about 1,100 people or so to be able to identify emerald ash borer um, in their cities. Um, the other thing we do is we have open houses and we um, have conferences where we have a regional meeting every year where we try to bring together um, industry, the university, researchers, and, and us to kind of have a, a, a workshop where we can all give updates on, you know, where is Emerald Ash Borer? What's the newest research coming out of the university? What, what are the newest um, management options for people? Um, so an example is in the city of Egan this past year, we had 240 citizens attend an EAB open house. I mean, and a lot of this, um, this work is funded through the USDA Forest Service. So we've gotten um, grants to do that. Uh, the other big part of that is our outreach for not moving firewood. As I said earlier, the, one of the main ways that emerald ash borer moves is through the movement of firewood. Um, and so we have an outreach grant that we get through the USDA Farm Bill every year. Um, we've been fortunate to keep receiving that money. Um, and through there, we, um, we use this to do advertising to to educate the general public. And some of the ways that we do this is we do statewide advertisements and we use print, we do digital, we have billboards, some of you might have seen some of the billboards out there. We have radio and TV. Um, one of the cool things that we did this year um, was we had icebox wraps. So right next to where the firewood was being sold, there's an icebox and there's a big icebox wrap that says don't move firewood. Um, so we, we're trying to, you know, get some new ideas and move our, our messaging forward to get it out to the, you know, the most amount of people. Um, so it's not just, and a lot of these have not just been metrocentric. We've been trying to get these out across the state to reach as many people as possible. Um, we've been partnering with, um, you know, with the DNR, with Extension, to try to keep our messages consistent, try to get that greater reach. Um, and like I said, this, is, this has mostly been um, funded through the USDA Farm Bill. Um, one of the uh, another thing that we do to keep the public updated is um, we have this interactive map. I showed you that earlier. Um, the cool thing about this map is that it's updated daily. So anytime we put new data in, or someone else gives us data, or someone puts in data through um, other means, that gets updated daily. Um, people can go on and find. You could go on and put your address in there and find out where the nearest um, emerald ash borer infected tree was to your home, and then that can help you decide. You know, do I want to treat my tree? Do I want to remove my tree? Um, what can I I do. So this is another um, way that we reach people. 
Um, and then probably one of the bigger things on our on our radar, and many of you may have heard this, is the possibility of um, the, the federal deregulation of Emerald Ash Borer. Um, and so what that would mean is that the USDA would remove the domestic quarantine that's currently in place. Um, and then they would stop all their, their functions that are associated with that quarantine. Um, so that would mean more resources would probably go into different types of management and research, such as biological control. So what does that mean? Excuse me, oh, excuse yes, me. is, is the, the uh, possibility mm -hmm. of, of uh, removing the quarantine just that, okay, we have to recognize this isn't working, therefore we have to shift the focus as to what we do in, in treating it? Mr. Chair, you mean in terms of the Fed? Right. Fed, yes, I believe that is the case. Okay. Yeah. So what does that mean for us? So that means as a state, we're going to have to make a decision, right? So the USDA currently has that federal quarantine, but we also have a state quarantine. So what does that mean? We're going to have to make some sort of decision. And so right now, what we're kind of looking at is we basically have three options. Um, we could keep the, the regulations as they are, adopt what the USDA currently has, so that would be keeping the status quo. We could do something different, um, combinations of what is currently there and modify things if we, you know, if we think that is the way to go, or we could just deregulate um, as the feds do. So those are like our, those are the three options that are currently on the table. Um, I can tell you that in all of the meetings that we've had with people, deregulating is not is not the favored. Um, the favorite option. So right now we're working on a proposal for something different. Good. Okay. Any further questions? Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Ambrose, uh, so back to the segue then, <laughs> would you talk a little bit about temperature and, and how that might be affecting Mr. Chair, I certainly can. So um, that's actually a, a fun thing to talk about. <laughs> um, so emerald ash borer freezes at, uh, at minus 29. And so right now we're at minus 37. So um, that, that takes us, that, that temperature takes us into the um, realm of 90% of mortality. Back, if you remember back in um, 2014, 2013, they documented at like minus 24, they documented about 60 to 70% mortality. So this this cold weather definitely is going to kill some emerald ash borer. And I would assume in a couple of weeks here, after it warms up, I'll send out some people and we'll, <laughs> we'll go see if we can find some blackened larvae and, you know, maybe do a little assessment of what the, the actual cold did. Um, Ms. Amborn, thinking about that, uh, obviously we would anticipate a slowdown, um, but you know, how much time do you think it would take for that to, for the reacclimation and the infestation to move in from other areas again? Mr. Chair, that's a great question. So, when when you think about insects, you know they they're just like reproducing. It's it's mania, and so a ninety percent you know, kill is gonna is gonna do a good thing for a year, right? But then if we go into next year and it, we don't get those temperatures, I mean, it's gonna knock it back and slow it down. But it's it, it isn't okay. going to be enough to, um, you know, to to completely eradicate it. So I mean, the cold weather definitely plays in our favor and has probably played a role in. Um, you know, one of the reasons the spread has been so slow through Minnesota, um, but in terms of at the end all be all, the, the weather's not going to do it. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much for the update. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Next, we're going to turn to the update on the gypsy moth. We have Kimberly Thielen Kremers, who, uh, with, again with the MDA, who will talk to us about that particular pest. Wonderful. Oh. Is this mic on? Yeah, yes, yes. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to come and speak about gypsy moth and a little bit uh, update on where the status is here in Minnesota. I'll talk a little bit about it nationally um, and then really focus on our goals here uh, this past year, some of the summaries from this past season, as well as looking forward into 2019. Gypsy moth is one of those pests that have we've been monitoring for 30 plus years since the early 70s here in the state of Minnesota. So it's a long-standing um, forest invasive pest that we've been watching and monitoring and trying to uh, keep out of Minnesota for as long as possible due to the uh, damage that it does to both our forest and our urban environments. 
Gypsy moth is, a, is an invasive uh, forest pest that was introduced from Europe uh, some uh, 100 plus years ago, back in the 1800s into Medford, Massachusetts. It is probably prior to EAB introductions in the early 2000s, gypsy moth was the most damaging pest in the US. Um, Emerald ash borer has kind of taken that fame now, killing uh, millions and billions of ash trees across our country. But gypsy moth still is a damaging pest, defoliating over 450,000 acres on average across the U.S. in particular areas of where it's uh, established and, and outbreaks are occurring. Gypsy moth, as like emerald ash borer, um, is a federally regulated pest. So a lot of the regulations in which uh, come down from USDA, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture also uh, coordinates that as well and partners with the, the federal agency to assure those regulations are followed within the state of Minnesota as well. A little bit of gypsy moth uh, distribution on a management on the, on the national scale. All the red areas on your map are areas in which gypsy moth uh, populations are established. Those are the areas in which we see those outbreak levels occurring in the natural forests and across our urban environments. Um, however, gypsy moth is only established in one third its geographical range within the U.S. So we are basically protecting the other two thirds of both the U.S. and as you can see, majority of Minnesota um, is yet to be established with this pest. So um, it is one that that we have uh, significant concerns with, with the, in both the environmental human impacts that this uh, pest will have. As you can imagine, having millions in uh, caterpillars crawling around uh, on the 4th of July when you want to be out camping in your favorite park or having your cocktail, um, you know, in your, in your, it's a, a pest that will, will be um, a human nuisance as well. Throughout the nation, we do we follow the same model. It's a, there's a national um, program for gypsy moth management across the U.S. You look at either if you do suppression in where it's um, an area's establishment, basically they're suppressing population where outbreaks are occurring. So there's uh, that's very limited management. It ends up being local residents, communities, townships um, is what focuses that management. Uh, there is a, a program called Slow the Spread, and I'll talk about that in, in a moment. But that's the a program out in advance of the front of Gypsy Moth to basically slow its advancement westward. And then anywhere out to the to the west of the area is eradication, where if we do find established populations, we go in and eradicate this pest 100%. Uh, similarly to, to Emerald Ashmore, um, probably even less, is Gypsy Moth's natural movement is very limited. So that's why you're going, it's been established since the 1800s. Why hasn't it moved into Minnesota? It's taking 150 plus uh, years to get here. It's for the fact that its movement nationally or naturally is only about um, five miles per year. It's pretty limited. And it's simply due to the, the small larval ballooning. The females and ma uh, female moths cannot fly. The artificial movement, it's the human assistant movement that allows this movement um, into areas of uninfestation. That's what kind of escalates that movement is all the human uh, transport of, of products that may have gypsy moth uh, in egg masses or life stages on them. This is the map you can see when I talk about the solid spread pushing into Minnesota. So we um, in Minnesota are looking at two forms of management. We are looking at both establishment where there's established populations in our northeastern Minnesota and Cook and Lake counties, and then where the advancing front is pushing into Minnesota in the southeast portion of our state um, into the St. Louis County area. So we do have this advancing population. So we're getting more and more um, isolated populations. I compare it to a forest fire where you're seeing these sparks out in advance that front. Um, we are looking for those sparks to slow that spread. And then anywhere uh, to the west in Minnesota is where we want to eliminate those populations 100%. Minnesota is very fortunate to be a part of a national program called Slow the Spread. This is a really unique model uh, program for pest management. It's a barrier zone concept in which we are a part of a nonprofit uh, foundation, which 11 states cooperatively work together to set uh, standards for both survey, treatment, management, um, cohesively. So it's a really unique project. It is funded through the US uh, DA Forest Service, um, in which Minnesota is a, is a partner of that. 
The goal of this program is to slow or reduce spread by, over, by at least 60 percent. And since the introduction of the program, Minnesota joined the project in 2004, um, we've been able to slow as a national spread model um, just month, almost up to 70 percent. So it's exceeded that 60 percent goal. Um, so it's been extremely effective in, in the goals in which we are, are, are reaching. We have basically protected more than 150 million acres uh, within that time frame um, since that establishment of this particular program. Minnesota greatly benefits from the Slow the Spread project, both indirectly um, and directly. Um, since 2004, we've received about $13 million in benefit, um, in which maybe the Forest Service has come in and done aerial applications for us. It's been direct um, payments, or we they offer assistance through for our surveys and detections. Um, in 2000, and that should be, excuse me for the typo there, 2018, Minnesota benefit w over $1 million from this program alone. This is the map just to show you how that is pushing in in areas in which we, we work. It's similar to the one a couple of slides ago. Um, you can see where ma majority of our work within the state of Minnesota is in that eastern half of Minnesota in which we do a lot of our survey detections. And how we, um, and there's a zoom up from Minnesota. Um, you can see the Cook and Lake counties in which quarantine. Um, those are established populations. Um, and basically, we do we still do some surveys and monitoring there, but we won't do a lot of intensive of treatments or eradication projects within that area because basically, it it's you know it becomes ineffective at that point. We really. Um, our goal is early detection surveys. So um, I brought kind of, you may have seen these. We placed 20,000 of these early detection traps across the state of Minnesota, focusing on that eastern uh, edge of Minnesota in which the population is moving in. Um, last year, in 2018, we captured 438 ma male moths within these detection traps. That only gives us an indication about population thresholds and if it's potential that there are populations there. It does not need established populations. So just because we have one or two moths does not mean establishment. Uh, they just give us early indication of potential population uh, pressure coming in. Our record high of moths across the state, you can see it's uh, last year was a low, our lowest since 20, uh, 2006, but we had a record high back in 2013 of 70,000, 71,000 moths plus across the entire state of Minnesota. 90% of those were found within that Lake Cook, St. Louis County, which eventually led to that quarantine of Lake and Cook County uh, in that northeastern portion of the state. Um, you talk about cold temperatures. Um, the brutal uh, um, uh, polar vortex of 2014 came in, um, uh, that the winter of 2013, which basically knocked that population down significantly. So in advance to ask the question about the cold, it's definitely um, one of those that does have an impact on our population dynamics, but again, will not have, um, will not completely eradicate the populations on itself. In 2018, so once we find these isolated populations way in out about in advance of the front we go in and we do aerial applications or management projects to either eradicate or slow those populations. Um, last year, looking at 2018 alone, uh, we had uh, five different sites uh, across Minnesota. Uh, close to 70, just over 73,000 acres together, uh, um, all those acres in which we, and again, this was fed, all these um, management proposals and, and eradication projects were uh, federally funded. And uh, results are really good. And we're going back, uh, one of the largest infestations that we've ever had in the state of Minnesota was in Lowry Hills, right in, in Minneapolis. Um, we literally had thousands and thousands of caterpillars crawling all over uh, the backyards of several residents' uh, properties. Uh, we went in last spring uh, after lots of public meetings and, and public scoping and environmental review process, and we were able to uh, treat that area with a biological insecticide, and we're able to eradicate. Um, uh, eradication is looking really good. Our survey results this year are coming back very good, but we'll take a couple of years to monitor that site to assure for eradication. Um, so it's very 
effective in which in, in these projects and we've been able to um, slow that spread. So since 1980, when we first, our very first um, project and management uh, project within the state of Minnesota, we have eradicated or the slowed the spread on, on over 100 unique sites across state of um, Minnesota and treated over 900,000 acres um, to slow or eradicate this invasive forest pest from Minnesota. And we hope to continue to be able to do that uh, into the future. Another th part of our program is um, working with the regulatory um, as well is to uh, minimize the human assistant movement through commerce, whether it be uh, firewood, logs, mills, um, nursery trade. Um, we do work with those individuals and those companies to assure that they can move their product very safely, yet assure that they are minimizing the risk in which they are introducing gypsy moth to new areas of Minnesota. And so this is just a uh, kind of a spot of different locations locations across the state in which we have compliance agreements and, and agreements and training with these facilities in order to move their product um, uh, very safely. Looking ahead to the 2019 season, um, we will again survey the eastern half of Minnesota. Uh, the map kind of shows some of the areas in which we'll be targeting for those 20,000 plus traps. They're set on kind of a grid-based system, so we should cover a very large area. Um, we have three proposals for aerial application at this point. Uh, there's a site in Chisholm, Stillwater, and Lakeville. And you can see the acres, um, fairly small blocks. The Stillwater one is gonna be about 500 acres after we remove some water resources out of there. Um, so total approximate acres is about 800 acres total for those aerial applications. So we're starting that public process right now, um, conducting those public meetings, um, working with those local, both city or county leaders, um, and to assure that uh, um, they're well informed about the project, questions, and, and make sure that we can hopefully go in and, and do this eradication project so we can continue to keep gypsy moth and Minnesota gypsy moth free for another 10, 20, 30 years, so is our hope. But with that, I'll open it up. Thank you, Ms. Kramers. Uh, quick question. Do they have any preferred tree that they like to eat, or are they pretty much just general opportunists and eat there, whatever they want? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. It has a Gypsy moth can feed on over 300 species of trees and shrubs, and that's why they're so devastating and damaging, and they can get a foothold pretty quickly. So they don't need just a single tree. They really don't care, and at some points, we'll even see them feeding on even some of their less preferred. So example is um, Colorado blue spruce, so some of the spruce trees. They'll feed on white pine fine, um, but you know if a white pine gets the leaves eaten off, it's, it's going to die. Where a deciduous tree can relief, so it stresses the tree. Um, we, gypsy moth isn't necessarily the killer of the tree. It will stress the tree to the point where other diseases and insects can move in. But it has this very, very wide host range. The other thing it so damages is a single egg mass. A female will, will lay one single egg mass in her lifetime, but that egg mass contained between 500 and 1,000 little viable caterpillars. So it doesn't take very many egg masses to get these established populations. And for example, in the Chisholm site, we only found you know, five or six what we could find you know, it's a needle in the haystack, but five or six egg masses, well, you keep multiplying that pretty quickly and it escalates pretty fast. Any other questions, committee members? Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just in regards to the aerial, aerial application, yes. uh, what type of herbicide or uh, foliant are you using? Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Chair, Thanks. Senator Goggin. We actually, we work with two specific products is what we actually target for these particular projects and it really has to do with the threshold of the biology of the site in the population. Um, two of the most significant ones is um, Bacillus thuringiensis cristaki, which is BTK. It's an organic um, certified product that uh, most people use in their organic gardening up to the date of harvest. So um, it's specific to moth and butterfly caterpillars only. So that's the one that we, we use pretty commonly in these high density populations. And the other one is a mating disruption, which is pretty unique. It's extremely specific. It's literally using the female pheromone and we apply it through a waxy substance or it could be a, a little tiny um, a flake 
kind of product is the carrier, but it's literally the female pheromone, and we scatter it amongst out when the males are out mating, and they're looking around trying to find the female in which to mate, and ultimately they can't find her, and mating doesn't happen, and then we actually eradicate the population. So it's extremely unique. Um, majority, of, a large percent of the populations are used with the mating disruption, but in these high concentrations, um, such that we have this particular seizing, we'll be looking at the Bexilis uh, thuringiensis crustaceae, the organic one. Anything else? If not, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, all of you from uh, the department, for the information that you have given us today. Before we leave, uh, I should turn to Senator Isaacson. Would you like to introduce your chief aide and chaperone that you have with you? This is actually my enforcer for my fundraising purposes. This I is my, my son, Ivor, who my wife decided to, not that it was a high bar, but dressed nicer than me. Yeah. And so. Well. And then he left for a little while, came back, and he actually had a pin that I had to run for, and apparently they just hand him out now. So yeah, well, well. that's awesome. So thank you. Very yeah. good. Well, welcome, Ivor. We're glad Ivor, to have you here. Ivor, can you say hi? Hi. Oh, hi. There we go. <laughs> uh, Senator Westrom? Sure. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, just uh, being most of this committee is the same as tomorrow's finance, uh, Ag Finance Committee, uh, just uh, let members know um, uh, with the Cold weather tomorrow, um, Senate is open, uh, but many committees, most committees have canceled uh, uh, out of respect for uh, those that might have to try to get here for hearings. Uh, we have done the same, and we will uh, reset next week's agenda with uh, some of what we had for tomorrow and uh, fit it in. It's just so members, committee members know, uh, we won't be having the Ag Finance tomorrow at 3. Okay, very good. Thank you. And with that, uh, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>